right, we're starting a new series today that I'm calling Mission Impossible, How to Live a Godly Life in an Ungodly Culture. And throughout this month of October and November, we're going to look at uh, what, we, what I call hot buttons. Somebody say hot. Ooh. Uh, hot button social issues that are taking place in our nation right now. And of course, I can't hit on everything in eight weeks, uh, but we are going to look at things that are going on in our nation, on the news, and uh, we're going to look at them through the filter of the Word of God. And I'm going to ask you in this series, let's, including myself in this, that we remove our personal filters and we look at what the Word says about things. Amen? And I want you to know right off the bat, we're not going to go political, we're going to go biblical. Because Jesus, last time I read the Bible, he is not going to come back on an elephant or a donkey. We're going to go biblical. Somebody say biblical. And here is, if we can, the question from the notes right now. This is the question that we're going to try to answer throughout this series. How do we stand firm in our faith while living in an ungodly culture? Now look at this. We don't just stop there, though, because that's where a lot of times people stop. How do we stand firm in our faith while living in an ungodly culture and at the same time lead in such a way that we're able to influence the culture towards Christ? Now, that's a big question and a big sentence, so let me say it again. How do we stand firm? Somebody say firm. So how do I stand firm in my faith when all of everything around me is ungodly? How do I stand firm in my faith when everything looks like it's shaking and darkness is creeping in on our nation? How do I stand firm and live a godly life in an ungodly culture? And at the same time, lead, somebody say lead, lead in such a way that we're able to influence the culture towards Christ. That's the big question that we're going to try to answer through this series, through the book of Daniel. I think when you look at that question, you kind of look at, in this day and age, maybe some people would think, is that even possible? Well, I want to say it's not only possible, it's doable in Jesus' name. There, there was a famous TV show in the 1960s and 70s. Of course, I saw the reruns of these shows, but they were called, they were called Mission Impossible. Anybody remember that show? Oh, man, it was, it was so awesome. And now six movies in... Now, six movies in, it has become one of the most highest grossing film series of all time. The IMF team, the Impossible Mission Force team, would be called in to save the world from some evil mastermind scheming a cataclysmic event. And with the odds stacked against them, somebody's like, I feel like I'm watching a TV show. With the odds stacked against them, somehow, even in the last few moments of that episode or the movie, They would find a way to save the world. Of course, this is a fictitious TV show and it's a fictitious movie. But I want to tell you that I believe with all my heart the Lord brought this to my mind to remind you and me that the original IMF team is the church. We are the original IMF team, the impossible mission force. And where everybody would say it's impossible, that we believe because of Christ that it is possible. And it's not only possible, it's doable. This morning, I want to open this message series and kind of paint a picture. I want to talk to you about grace and truth. Grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking in these few minutes as we dive into Daniel, not only today but throughout the series, would you speak to us, Holy Spirit? Lord, I remember some of these stories in my childhood in Sunday school. But I'm praying whether we've heard the stories a thousand times or we've never heard them before, that you bring something new to us. Reveal, revelation, speak to us. I also pray that the church here, Emmanuel, that we love, that we would not only buy into this truth, but we would actually believe that we can make a difference in the culture. We don't have to watch by the sidelines and hope things get better. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you. 
We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Using two words on social media to identify themselves as survivors of sexual harassment. Chaos in the streets at a Donald Trump rally. One day, something he had never thought he would ever see. A patient using marijuana right in the hospital room. Those images that we just saw on that 50-second video that our interns put together for us, thank you interns, can be alarming and even offensive, but it is the world that we live in. And I want to tell you, for the most part, the church, capital C, is not addressing it or talking about what's going on. So a lot of Christians, we just don't know how to respond to everything that's happening. We, we, we know that, that things are a mess, and we know that things are, are wrong, and we see that the culture is getting darker and darker. Things that I've seen even in the last three months on the news or read or even heard about things going on in my home state of Alabama. I can't believe, I've, like, like I've, I've said, I used to hear my dad say this, and now I'm saying, I can't believe this is actually happening. And I think the church overall is thinking those thoughts and wondering how in the world do we respond to all this. So we're, we're going to look at that, and I'm going to just say this. We live in a culture, in a society. Don't forget, this is culture. Culture is the way things are. That's what culture is. If I just to give you a simple definition, culture, society, it's just the way things are right now. All right? Not that it has to stay that way, but that it's the way things are. Our culture and society right now is aggressively, somebody say aggressively, is aggressively going away from God. And we as a church, even Emmanuel Fellowship right here, but capital C, we are faced with some critical upcoming decisions. We're in a dilemma. I'll say it like Grandma Owen used to say it. We're in a pickle. The church is in a pickle. And I believe behind that that God is cornering the church and saying, what are you going to do? Because this has been a long-standing assignment or a mission given to us to be the light of the world. I think he's asking us, are you going to, Lord, help my voice stay. It's been going. I don't know why. <clears throat> oh, I know why. I spoke three times every day for five days in Motown. So that's why. Um, so God give me grace. But I'm just going to say this. We've got to recognize and understand that with the culture getting darker doesn't mean that we can't get brighter. That we are the light of the world. One of the prayers we pray a lot around here as elders is that we pray, God, let our influence get greater and our light get brighter. Let our light get brighter and our influence get greater in Jesus' name. And that shouldn't be just Emmanuel as a church, but also as us as individuals. We're in a pickle. I'm going to throw out some questions to you in this beginning message. Another question right here. Are we going to, look at this, are we going to engage this culture and lead with the love of Christ or are we going to disengage and endure until Jesus comes back? Or even worse, will we compromise and simply go with the flow? So are you and I going to engage this dark culture? And by the way, I never put people in that status. Because we wrestle not with flesh and blood. The enemy wants us to fight people. That is not the fight. The fight is in prayer, and that's why we have a once-a-month corporate prayer service. Tonight, all we're going to do is pray for our nation. Come out and join us for one hour. I know it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient for me, too. Come out and join us as we pray. No one's going to put a mic in your face, but pray with us together as we pray and stand in the gap for our nation. The battle is always won first on our knees. Always won first on our knees. I know the thought going through some people said, I don't know how to pray. You know what? The great way to learn how to pray is get around people that pray. Are we going to engage? Somebody say engage. Are we going to engage this culture and lead with the love of Christ? 
or are we going to disengage and endure? Let's just, let's just stay in our building. Let's just hide. Let, let, let's, let's put our proverbial head in the sand. Um, just wait on the sweet by and by. Or even worse, worse, and it's happening in the church across our nation. Will we compromise the gospel to get people in seats and simply go with the flow? There are some hard choices for us to make in the days ahead because things aren't going to get easier. Scripture tells us that. Are you with me this morning? And here's the deal. Once you and I decide, okay, I'm going to stand firm in this. I'm, I'm going to try to lead. Once you and I make that conscious decision, I'm going to stand firm in my faith. Once you make that decision, then the immediate question that comes in your mind and your heart is, but how do I navigate through all this? I, I'm, I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to love people. But how do I, how do I navigate through all this mess and and i got a lot of feelings about this mess. I don't like this stuff. I don't like what's happening. How do I navigate through all this? Well, the great news is God didn't leave us alone. He gave us his owner's manual, his love letter, to help us build a net. This is a GPS right here, the Word of God. It's a love letter. It's an owner's manual. You get your car, you, and they tell you. I don't know if anybody ever does it. Some of you do. I know you do. But most people don't read the owner's manual. Only in times of emergency. Where is that thing? But this is the owner's manual. Can I tell you what? Don't read this just in times of emergency. Meditate on this thing day and night, the Lord told us. Stand on the Word of God. When you got nothing else to stand, stand on the Word. Amen? He gave us this. And so, you know, we could go a whole bunch of places, but we're going to park in Daniel for this series because I believe that Daniel, the book of Daniel, is a prophetic picture of what's going on in our nation right now. And we can look at Daniel's life and the three boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, by the way, that wasn't their given names. The culture changed their names. Let's talk about that next week. The culture is trying to change your name so that you would compromise you got to stay with your God-given name. That's next week. But anyway, we've got to recognize and understand when we don't know what to do, we need to go to the B-I-B-L-E. Because that is the book for me and you. So we're going to look at how Daniel and his three Jewish friends, how they lived a God-honoring life, listen to me, in a completely heathenistic culture. Babylon was anti-Jehovah. They were anti-God. They were many gods. We're going to look at this through Daniel. And somehow, here's the crazy thing in all this, somehow Daniel and these three boys not only lived a godly life, but they were promoted in leadership. So they, made, they engaged with the culture and they made a Christ difference. They made a Christ impact. And that's what God's calling us to be. What, what in the world was their secret? Well, let me give you context before we read right now in Daniel chapter 1. Judah, the southern kingdom, had been invaded by Babylon. There was two kingdoms. Remember Israel, much like a church split, Israel had a split. And ten kingdoms went to the north. And two went to the south, and the southern kingdom was Judah, and the northern kingdom was Israel. We're not talking about Israel. They've already been invaded by the Assyrians. You'd think Judah would have learned their lesson <laughs> watching their big brother. But Judah rejected God, rejected God, rejected God. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to warn them. And finally God said, I can't take it anymore. And so he allowed, listen to these words, he allowed Babylon to destroy Judah. And Jerusalem, the capital city. He killed off the old. And literally, all the young, he took them into captivity as slaves. Daniel, biblical historians tell us he was probably around 16 years old. And him and thousands of others were taken into slaves. I'm giving you context now. Let's go to the word. Daniel chapter 1. And it says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, that's the final king in Judah before this. Look at this. You get, focus on these words. We read sometimes scripture too fast. 
During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now look at this word. This is very important. The Lord gave him. Who's him? Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him. God allowed him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. God's heart had to be grieving while this was taking place. So Nebuchadnezzar, second part of verse 2, so Nebuchadnezzar took them, what's them, the sacred objects from the temple, took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God, little g-o-d. Verse 3, then the king ordered Aspenaz, remember that name, we're going to really talk about him next week. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and some other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Look at this, verse 4. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Man, that sounds like your pastor. Strong, strong, healthy, good-looking, wise Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Where, is it in there? I think it's somewhere. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Wrong book. Uh, select only strong, healthy, good-looking young people like the people in this room here, no matter what age you are. Select only strong, healthy, good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are all well-versed. Now, look at this. This is very key. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. So what happened was he took of the thousands of the royal family and said, you're not going to be slaves out in the fields. You're going to be over here and you're going to serve in the palace. But before you come, we're going to indoctrinate you. Look at this. And here's the indoctrination. Train these young men in the language and the literature of, say it with me. Train these young men in the language and the literature. Indoctrinate them. Program them. Get that Jehovah God out of them and program them to serve and know Babylon. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. By the way, that food broke every dietary restriction of of Judaism. Every one of them. And he did it on purpose. He's going to see if these guys are going to compromise. Give them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for, say it with me, three years. That's some intense indoctrination. And they were found to enter, and then they would enter the royal service. Last verse, Daniel, Hananiah, there's their real names. Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, Michelle, excuse me, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. Now, let me just say this to you real quick about the book of Daniel. If you would, quickly turn over to John chapter 8. We'll go there and close out in just a moment. But here's the deal. The book of Daniel is not only a book of history. A lot of people talk about Daniel being a book of history. Actually, the first six books, excuse me, the first six chapters in Daniel are history. They're stories, wonderful stories. Anybody remember the three boys in the fiery furnace? Hello. All right, if you grew up in church, you heard about that. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you heard about the three boys in the fiery furnace. Or how about this one, Daniel in the lion's den? Yes, those are stories we've heard, known. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you heard about Daniel and those lions. And what in the world happened? We heard those stories. They're stories, the first six chapters. The last six chapters are prophecy, and and I'm telling you, they're prophecy about the days we're living in right now. And there's no way in an eight-week series we can dissect all this, but we're going to try our best. But here's the thing I want to just tell you is, like I said earlier, Daniel is not only a book of history and prophecy, it is a prophetic book overall about the day we live in right now. And we look at Daniel's life and see how he did it and say, God, could you help me live like Daniel? And by the way, Daniel started on his knees. He was a man of prayer. We have to recognize the times we're living in right now. We are in a, I'm just going to, we are in a Kairos moment in time. So my watch right here uh, that my wife blessed me with um, is Kronos. Time has two Greek words. One is Kronos, time, real time. And then there's Kairos, which is an opportune moment in time. We are in a Kairos moment. We are in an opportune moment in time. 
And we've got to discern these times right now that we're living in. And church, not beating around the bush, we are in evil, dark times. And the church is going to make a decision in the next year or so, capital C, who are we going to be? What are we going to do? How in the world can we solve this problem? How do we lead with love and yet stand firm in our faith? How do I stand firm and not compromise on the Word of God, but how at the same time lead with love? Well, Daniel has a lot of examples in that. We need to be like the sons of Issachar. Look on the screen right here with me. The sons of Issachar, it says there were 200 leaders of the tribe within their relatives. All these men, look at this, all these men understood the signs of the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. May we walk in that type of discernment as a church. And it's not just men, I'm speaking as a church and as families and individuals. May we understand the day that we're living in, the hour that we're living in. We are on the precipice of the return of our king. But church, I'm telling you, it's going to get darker. And we can't just put our proverbial head in the sand and hope that it goes away. We are accountable for this neighborhood. We are accountable for these homes. We are accountable for this community. We are accountable. And it's not just PC's job. It's the church of the living God. PC being Pastor Chris, for those that don't know. A lot of people call him PC now. But somebody's like, PC, personal computer? I, no. But it is, it is all. Somebody say All. It is all our responsibility. And you know what? When we hear that, especially, listen to me, if you've grown up in church at all, you look at this and go, I I just can't, I can't talk to people. I don't have any, like Ian told me, you know, Ian two weeks ago, he challenged us, do we have any non-Christian friends, truly non-Christian friends? And they're our friends. And he challenged us that we need to befriend everyone. Look, my close, close, close friends are all Christians and they're in love with Jesus and they're passionate for God because I know whoever I hang around, that's who I'm going to become. Number one, hello, the company you keep is who you are. All right, But number two, we've got to recognize and understand there is, there is a world out there and the church has to be the hands and feet of God and we have to befriend people that do not know Him. Jace, I love what you're doing. I love how you're befriending so many people that do not know God, and God is honoring you, my brother, and I'm honoring you now publicly among all these people, and you're inviting people to church every stinking week because you you see the need. The need is real. And guess what? We can't pretend as a church that... Well, we're living in a different day. I'm going to just tap my feet together and say, we're living in a different day. We're li- no, no, we're going to just do, keep doing church the same way. We're gonna keep, they're going to come. They're eventually going to come. There is a day coming when they will not come except for a move of God. But it doesn't mean we can't go to them and do real needs and meet real needs and help people and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I realize those statements make people feel uncomfortable. They make my flesh feel uncomfortable. Look at this right. If you're taking notes, take this down real quick. Pastor Chris Hodges says this. I'm going to give you three things. He says, when culture shifts, it's critical that we as as Christians respond. Somebody say respond the right way. It's critical. It's vital. It's super important that as Christians, we respond the right way. By and large, the church is responding the wrong way. And I want to give you three things. By and large, the church, capital C, is responding the wrong way. Number one response is this. Do nothing. Hide in our buildings. I've already said it. Put our proverbial head in the sand and hope the problem goes away. Don't get involved. And many churches are living this and ministering that way. But I remind you, doing nothing solves nothing. Doing nothing solves nothing. So we found out just recently, in the last couple months, that at Northwest, it is not the school, but it is held at Northwest, there is a food pantry. And they were running out of food. And so I immediately brought this to the elders. And we didn't even have to pray about it. We just said, we got to meet this need. And so we've been given for years to the big food pantry, the local food pantry. 
But we have made a shift and a change to say, our backyard is hurting. There are kids going to sleep hungry. I met with a social worker last uh, two weeks ago, and she told me, here's my case file. If you guys want to help these families, these are the ones that are really, really hurting. And I was like, oh, my Lord. And she said, but the first way is, could you help us with the food pantry, please? And so we've turned our food, our, our collection thing, which is two, two big blue buckets, we've turned that into helping. Give them dry goods, everything we can. Just every t- if you ever got an extra, just bring it, put it in there, and John Penry will take it over to the, to the school. It's not the school, it's a food pantry that's held at the school. That's a real need. I'm hungry. That's just one. That's doing something. You know what? I, I've, I've learned this. I used to be under such guilt. I can't, I can't help. I can't help. I used to get under so much guilt. I can't do everything. And the Lord said, just do something. You can't save the world, but you can help this part of the world right here. It makes it smaller and it makes it doable with God's help. Response number two. Are you with me still? Response number two, by and large, the church is responding the wrong way. Response number one is do nothing. Response number two is a dogmatic approach. You're wrong and I'm right. You're going to hell because you're wrong. And we do it really bad on social media. Bad. It's, it's awful. I've unfriended close friends of mine recently on Facebook because of things they have said so harsh toward people. I'm like, I cannot associate with that. They're going to always be my friend, but not on Facebook. We can't be this harsh, dogmatic, you're going to go to hell. They may go to hell. And can I just tell you, let me just say it like this. You may be right, but if you do right the wrong way, you're wrong. You may be right, and you are if you stand with the Word of God. The Word of God is always right. But if you do right the wrong way, you are wrong. I'm wrong. We, gotta, we were never called to be right. We were called to be effective. We were never called to be right. We were called to be lovers of God and lovers of people. They will know us one another by our love, not by the things we hate. I'm afraid the church is known for everything they hate and not for what they love. Response number three, this is the one that scares me to death, it's hyper grace. Maybe many of you know about this. It's becoming a huge movement in the church, capital C. Hyper grace is God loves everyone. And by the way, that is true. But then they go, and so we can coexist together, and you can, do, you can believe what you want to believe, and I can believe what I want to believe, and I'll give you grace, and you give me grace, and, and hey, we'll just all get along. And what they've done in this movement, and it's really, regretfully, it's in a lot of young adults and young people, and it's exploding in the church, is they basically have said they have dropped the Word of God in the name of love. We're just going to love everybody. And the part of the balance is we are supposed to love everybody, but at the same time we have to stand firm on the Word of God. And so we have to stand firm in our faith, but yet lead with love. These are responses. I want to submit to you in these last few minutes As we close out in John chapter 8, I want to submit to you what I believe is the biblical response through Daniel. It's grace and truth. Not hyper grace, grace and truth. Not crazy hyper grace. Hey, God will forgive you. This is hyper grace. I've heard this from from many people. God will forgive you, so just go and have a good time. He'll forgive. That's hyper grace. That's actually taking the grace of God for granted. So doing nothing, dogmatic approach, hyper grace, those are all uh, unbiblical responses. The biblical response is grace and truth. Look at this scripture right here. I love John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's the word? Jesus. And we beheld his glory. Look at this. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Say it with me. Full of grace and truth. And the Word became flesh, that's Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. He was full of grace and truth. 
It wasn't one or the other. It was both, boss. It was grace and truth, and it was a balance of it. We poured out grace, but we stood on truth. What is grace? Well, in my simple mind, I'm going to kind of just bring it to a close. Grace, you know, God saved us by grace. Grace is a gift. Grace is unconditional love. Grace is Jesus. What is truth? Everybody's asking that, by the way. 30 and below, that's what they're asking. In all the colleges, by the way, I've said this before, all the colleges that are secular, they are indoctrinating our future leaders. I went to a secular college before I went. I went to Auburn before I went to Christ for the Nations. I called my dad many times. I was so confused. I was 21, and I took a world religion class. Big mistake. I I had to take a religious class. That was just, oh, Lord. I was so confused, and my dad had to walk me through Scripture because I was like, this doesn't make sense, Dad. They're saying this, and it kind of makes sense. And I grew up in a Christian home. So my dad had to stand on the tree and say, son, listen, I always knew he was serious when he said, Christopher, listen up. Why is it they call you by your full name? (laughs) Christopher Nelson Frith, get your butt in here, you know. I was like, oh, Lord, you know, when you're a kid. Grace is Jesus. What is truth? Truth is God's standard. And by the way, listen to me, this is really important, we get this. When the culture changes, and it does, and as culture shift is darker and darker, the Word of God remains the same. The Word stays the same. The Word never changes. Culture gets darker, culture changes, but I don't, because if you stood on shifting sands, you're never going to go anywhere. You're just going to be all over the place. I want to stand on something that's bedrock. I want to stand on something that's concrete. I want to stand on the rock of Jesus Christ, and that is found in His Word. Parents, if you've got young ones, start now reading the Word over them. Peter Pan's great for about 10 minutes. Then go to the Word, the real thing. The Word. Get the Word in their hearts when they're young, so they will not depart from it. He's calling us, God is calling us to stand firm and love well in this hour. Last quote before we close out on John 8. Look at this, Pastor Chris Hodges says this. Without truth, we become worldly. Without grace, we become judgmental. Look at this. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. I gotta, you got to get that in your spirit. Somebody may need to write that down. Without truth, we become worldly. So if you don't have the truth, you're going to become like the world. Without grace, we become judgmental. Church, we got to show people grace. we got to cut each other some slack. By the way, if we can't show grace here, we're never going to show grace out there. Let's cut each other some slack and give each other grace. Well, he's not, she's not. D- d- no, just give each other grace. That unconditional love. By the way, that you and I have been shown all the time by God. Why would we hold something back that's being poured out on us every single day? Without truth, we become worldly. Without grace, we become judgmental. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. Truth without grace is, say it with me, mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. So let's look at the biblical example as we close. Worship team's going to come forward. I don't want you to let them distract you. Let's look at this right here on the screen. Look at this together. A story that we all know. Here is one example. Stay with me. Right on the screen, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was called back at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. If you notice, any time Jesus had a chance to talk about something, the kingdom, he was going to do it. Crowd gathered, all right, everybody gather around, I'm going to give you a lesson. And of course, we all know, when they would walk away, they'd be like, he taught like no one I've ever heard before. I'll probably say because he treated people like they had never been treated before. But look at this. As he was speaking, the teachers, here they go again. The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman. Now look at these words right here. Who had been caught in the act of adultery. How did they know this? I've always thought about that. How did they know that she had been caught in the act? 
They brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses, now look at the throne. What are they throwing to Jesus? The law. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Here we go. We got him. We got him. We got him. You know what? Look what it says. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and started doodling in the dust with his finger. You ever doodled in the dust when you were a kid? I used to play in the dust. We even ate roly-polies. Remember, remember roly-polies? We ate those things. That's why my bones are so strong. My wife's probably not going to kiss me for like a week now. But uh, I was seven, honey. I was seven. Doodled in the dust. Next verse. They kept demanding an answer. You tell us. They were trying to trap him. You tell us. This woman needs to be murdered right now in front of all of us. You tell us. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, all right. I can tell him Jesus is probably a little frustrated. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down and started dueling again. Some people wonder what he was dueling. Historians tell us different things. Some people said he was throwing out people's secret sins. Other people said that he was throwing out their mistresses, Martha, Lydia, <laughs> Joanne. We don't know what he was writing. I'm just having fun with that. But look at this. He was writing something and they saw it. And they heard the conviction and the truth. They heard the truth. When the accusers heard this, what was this? Hey, if you without sin, throw it. Throw that rock. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't any one of them condemn you? And last verse, look at this. No, Lord, she said. And look what Jesus said. He gives truth and grace all in the same sentence. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And there's the truth. Go and sin no more. He didn't just give her grace. I'm not going to condemn you. He said, daughter, go and sin no more. We don't know the end of that story. But I can tell you this. We'll meet that woman one day. And her life was changed by those last words. But she had probably been judged all her life. And maybe in the eyes of man, rightfully so. But guess what? We've all been judged. And we've all made bad mistakes. And we all sin. In this room, we're all sinners. Saved by grace. That grace has been poured out on me a thousand times. And guess what? There it is tomorrow morning. That mercy and then that grace by Jesus. Jesus is grace. Jesus is truth. And that is how, as a church, we must respond in these dark days. Let's pray together.